I want us to take a look at a passage that we find in the 22nd chapter of Matthew. And in this chapter, we find a commandment from our Lord. Uh, the, the setting of this is a, a person who is a well-educated person of faith comes to Jesus and asks him uh, in, a, in a way that uh, perhaps is a way to trick him. He says, Jesus, what is the greatest of all commandments? And that's a hard job. That's a hard, hard assignment, we may think. But Jesus does this in a way that is beautiful, a way that is in many ways artistic in the way he uses it uses these words. And I invite you to go to Matthew chapter 22 and listen, verse 36, the teacher's question, and then 37 following Jesus' response. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, today we're going to be looking at the way in which God has called us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and others add, and all of our strength. Uh, we're going to be looking particularly at Deuteronomy 5. The words there are also found in Exodus 20. And these are the Ten Commandments. Now it's interesting that we see that Jesus is able, as he says, to summarize all of the law and prophets with just a couple sentences. Sentences that don't even complete a paragraph. Now if you look at the Testament, the Old Testament, you see that it is divided into three main categories of text. You have the law, the prophets, and the writings. The law, the prophets, and the writings. There are 39 books in the Old Testament, 26 of which are law and prophets. And so 26 books of the Old Testament are summarized by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with these words. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's amazing that he does this. But before Jesus does this, the Father says to Moses, this, this shepherd and this prophet that is taking the people out of slavery, and he says to him, I want to lay a foundation for my people from which all other laws, from all other the commandments of life will come, and these things are known as the Ten Commandments. So Moses receives Ten Commandments, and later Jesus takes the Ten as well as all the other law and prophets and summarizes them. And so what we want to do this week and next is take Jesus' commandment and use the Ten Commandments as a way to help us understand how to live for God, particularly this week, how to live for God by loving the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all of our strength. It's important that we read the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus Christ. This is very important. For New Testament Christians, as we call ourselves, are people that read the Old Testament. It is God's Word, it is speaking to us, but it speaks to us through Jesus Christ. We can misinterpret the old if we don't understand that it's pointing to the new, that it's pointing to Jesus Christ. And so we keep that in mind as we read the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, because if we're not careful, if we don't look at it through the eyes of Jesus, we can become legalistic in the way that we try to keep the Ten Commandments. And so I invite you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 5. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, we are going to read the introduction as well as the first four of the Ten Commandments. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 5, we hear the story of Moses being given the law, and then he goes and shares it. Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear, O Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our fathers that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire of the mountain, on the mountain. At that time I stood between the Lord and you to declare to you the word of the Lord because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up the mountain. And he said, I am the Lord your God who have brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. 
You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gate, so that your manservant or in maidservant may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath. As we look to these verses to understand how God is leading us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and our strength, we can take these verses and see God's instructions for our lives. Now, I want you to look at a couple words of introduction. There's a reason I didn't just jump right into the first commandment. Because this is not what they heard. Before they heard the Ten Commandments, they heard an introduction from Moses and from God. And these are important to hear because through these words of introduction, they understand why these laws are important. And they need to understand why God has the right, should we say, to give these commands. So first of all, look at verse 3 again. Verse 3, he said, It was not with our fathers that the Lord made this covenant, but with us with all of us who are alive here today. In other words, in so many words, you cannot pass the buck. He says to them, this covenant was not made with those people that came before you. This is made with you. In other words, you have the responsibility to keep this. We are pretty crafty at taking things that said before and kind of change them into what we want them to say. And we're crafty to say, well, God spoke to that person and, and it's good for him or her, but it's not that way for me. And what he's saying to them is this is a covenant made with you. Don't take it back, generations. Know that it's made with you. And we look at the New Testament, and that is why personal belief in Jesus is so important. It's not something that someone else did or a, future gener or a latter generation does, does, but it's something where we understand that it's a personal decision. Okay, so they say, well, maybe they're asking well, God, why do you have a right to tell us? Now, that should be an assumption, but God says, let me just clarify why you need to listen to me. Verse 6, another part of the introduction. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I see this as the don't bite the hand that feeds you verse. And this is, remember, folks, where you came from. You came from a land of slavery where you were the slaves, where you were oppressed. Now, I think it's important for us to understand that he knew they would not go back into slavery to another nation, to other people, until much later when that nation betrayed him again. But what they could fall into is slavery to selfish ambition and, and, sl and slavery to meaningless quest of significance that are not grounded in the love of God. So he says, don't fall back into the slavery. It, it is a land of pursuit. It is a mode of pursuit that we can get trapped in. And I find it ironic, and perhaps you do as well, that we live in a country where we say that we have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as inalienable rights. That is beautiful. I love that. But why in the world are we the, the country in the world that has the most depression, the most sadness, the most pe stressed out people on the planet? Why? Because we surrender to slavery that we put upon ourselves. We take on those things upon us that we can't handle, and we take upon those things that God is not pleased, and therefore we are the most stressed out people on the planet, and we should not be. It's the land of the free, and we act like we're slaves to everything around us. And so we're going to understand through these texts ways in which we can be free in Him. So let me give you Four ways. There's notes in your, in your worship folder to help you remember these. Ways in which that you can love the Lord your God. First of all, have no other gods. Have no other gods. 
Deuteronomy chapter 6, the chapter after the Ten Commandments are listed in chapter 5. Chapter 6, verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. One theologian said that God needs to be the total horizon of our lives and experience. The total horizon of our life and our experience. That, the thing in which we look upon, He is the one. He is the horizon. He is the one that keeps our sight straight. Now, over the years that I've been in Alaska, I've been uh, fishing, uh, halibut fishing that is, about 10 to 12 times, somewhere in there. And I'm about half and half. Half and half. Now, half and half what? Well, half the time, I have a wonderful time catching fish. The other time, I spend feeding the fish. About half and half. And, and this is how it goes. On the, on the days that I catch fish and enjoy it, uh, I'm catching fish and enjoying it, caught up in the moment. I go back happy and we have fish and we eat it for a long time. Other times, here's how it goes, and not to be too crude, but here's how it goes. Catch a fish, throw up, go lie down. Catch a fish, throw up, go lie down. It, it's, it's just misery. Misery. And you know these things that take you like six hours out in the middle of the ocean. And you're like, can't we just be 30 minutes away from shore? And now, everybody else has to get their limit. You're just laying there feeling horrible. And you know it's bad when you're on the bottom of the boat just laying there, you know. And you just feel horrible. And guess the news or the word of advice they always give me. Look for the horizon. Look for the horizon. Why is that? So you can figure out where land is. You can figure out where even is. Because if you don't see the horizon, all you feel is this. And hope you're not getting seasick because I'm doing this. But you look at the horizon. Now, does it work all the time? No. But it does work eventually. It does work. And so what we need to do is focus our eyes on the horizon. Anytime we put something or someone else in the seat of God, we are losing a horizon. We are tossed, as Scripture says, by every wave that comes our way. We get sick emotionally. We get sick physically. We are worn out by life because we do not look upon life through the eyes and through the lens of God, keeping God on the throne upon which He and He alone belongs. Now, some of you say, well, I don't have any other false gods. I don't have any other thing in my life or people in my life that take the place of God. Well, a couple of our small groups are doing a Bible study called Gods at War. And Kyle Adaman has spent a lot of time talking about gods that we can put into our lives. Most of the time, without intention, it just happens. And I want to point out a few of those gods that he uh, speaks of. And he, he lists nine gods from his book, Gods at War. And he puts them in three different temples. And the first is a temple of pleasure. And under the temple of pleasure, in the temple of pleasure, he says there's three gods. God of food, God of sex, God of entertainment. And he says there's a temple of power under which there's three gods. God of success, God of money, God of achievement. He says here's another temple, temple of love, which has the God of romance, the God of family, and the God of me. Let's recap those nine. Food, sex, entertainment, success, money, achievement, romance, family, me. What do you see in those nine? They're all good things. Not one of those is bad in and of itself. What happens is we take those good things and misuse them. We take money and make it our pursuit. We take sex and use it outside of marriage. We, we take food and become gluttons. We take success and make that what we are to use uh, to have value in life. We take entertain, entertainment and choose those forms of entertainment we have no business dealing with. We take these things and make them gods in and of themselves. He goes on later in the book and talks about some state, statements upon which we can reflect to figure out who God is, who those small gods rather are in our life. He says we are wired for worship. We talked about this in previous weeks about God placing eternity in our hearts as Ecclesiastes says. God has wired us to worship and that's why people worship different things even if they don't worship God. Worship success, worship Hollywood, worship fame, worship money, uh, worship attraction, whatever it may be. We are wired for worship. Our choices are a strong indication of what gods we are worshiping. Here's some statements to reflect upon. What I choose to do for a living. How I choose to manage my money. What I choose to watch on TV. The people I choose to have as friends. The websites I choose to visit. The clothes I choose to wear. The way I choose to spend my day off. The food I choose to eat, what I choose to think about, 
All of these choices reveal my God of choice. All the choices we make on a day-to-day basis reveal our God of choice. And that helps us understand that we're not talking uh, about a little statue sitting somewhere that we bow down and worship. We're not talking just about some pagan religion that we follow. Those, those, Those are realities in our culture. But for most of us, that is not the reality. For most of us, the reality is there's something else or someone else that has taken the place of God. And by reflecting upon our lives in some of these statements, we can identify who they are and what they are. Now, there's the next commandment, the next way that we can love the Lord our God, and that is to make no idols. Make no idols. Most of the time we think about making no idols, we are correct in saying that God does not want us to form things, um, whether it be out of clay or metal or wood or whatever, and and worship that as a God. But there's something deeper there as well. You see this in the Old Testament. Uh, I was reading on this, and it really made some sense to me that the second commandment is make no images or make no idols. The first commandment is have no other gods. And so if the second commandment is simply saying, don't make other gods, then it's kind of redundant. The problem they had more so than making other gods at this point was that they made things that represent God and began to rely upon them as their access to God. Do you understand that? Have you been there where you think this is the thing that really makes me have a wonderful relationship with God. You rely upon it. You rely upon a place. You rely upon an emotional feeling. You rely upon some kind of intellectual uh, understanding of a certain text of scripture. You you rely on a relationship with somebody and you say, wow, without this person, I don't have as as close a connection with Christ. So if they fall, I fall. If they succeed, I succeed. And, And we take things and we make them gods in and of themselves when they first were meant just to point to God and they become gods in and of themselves. And a few of these I want you to ask for questions that help you understand what those gods may be in your life, what those idols or those images may be in your life. And first of all, we talk about um, Nahum Sarna as a Hebrew scholar, and he understands, obviously, being a Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew faith. And he says this, he says, all this, all this idol making, image making, all this constitutes the opposite of Israelite monotheism, that's worship of one God. The essence of which is that God is absolutely sovereign precisely because he is wholly independent of the world he created and does not adhere in it. To represent an invisible God in any material and tangible form whatsoever is by definition to distort the divine reality. It compromises God's absolute transcendence. Now, when it comes to faith, you have people on opposite extremes. You have people that have a, some kind of faith or spiritual experience that view God as simply a deist. That is, that there's some kind of creative power that put everything in motion, and then he stepped back from his creation. That's deist. I believe in a deity. I don't, have, I don't know his name. I don't know what he did. I don't know if it's a, if it's a thing, if it's a force. What is it? May the force be with you. you know, whatever it is. It's some kind of vague God that created something. I have no personal relationship with him. On the other side, you have people that become so intimate with God that they take him for granted. They become buddy-buddy with God and forget to respect him. And so you see polar opposites. The Christian faith is one that says, I recognize that God is sovereign and God is God and God can do what God wants to do. And I also recognize, as Jesus most clearly points out, that God is with us, that God dwells with us. And as people living past the resurrection, the Spirit is with us. So God created us, yes, and God cares about us, yes, and we have to bring that together. So let me ask you four questions that you can ask yourself to identify if you may have images or idols in your life that you need to get rid of. First of all, do I use a symbol of God as a good luck charm? Do I use a symbol of God as a good luck charm? Perhaps there's something that represents God to you, and you feel like if I lose access to this, um, I, I'm, I'm not going to have access to God. Maybe it's a lucky coin or a cross around your neck or uh, some kind of certain thing. You say, if I don't say the right words or have the right option, uh, <laughs> object, then I'm not going to have my good luck. Guess what? Sovereignty and luck don't go hand in hand. Sovereignty and luck do not go hand in hand. Second question. I, do I believe without seeing? Do I believe without seeing? Jesus said to his disciples, blessed are those who believe and do not see. Do you have to see God at work before you believe that God's at work? If you do, you may have a long wait. Because sometimes we don't see God at work. 
But when we know God's at work, then we begin to see because we have eyes to see it. Third question, do I pray only the prayers I have memorized? I have memorized. Nothing wrong with memorizing prayers. It's beautiful. Memorize the Psalms. There's prayers there. Memorize the Lord's Prayer. Memorize great prayers throughout ch church history. But if you only pray other people's words, exclusively only pray other people's words, then you're missing out on opportunity to have a conversation with God. Sometimes we make prayer uh, too holy or too, too special in the way that we want to use certain words and sound like we always know what to say to God. The Bible points out sometimes you're not going to know what to say to God, and that's where the Holy Spirit steps in and lifts your words to Him. Talk to God and listen to God. Don't try to sound really holy in your words. Just talk to Him. Recognize His sovereignty. Also recognize He loves you and wants to have a conversation with you. Fourth question, do I feel like I can pray only in my favorite spot to do so? Great to have a prayer closet. Great to have a chair you sit in to have devotion with God. Great to have some mountaintop where you can go meet God. That's a wonderful thing. But if that's the only place where you think you can meet God, you're missing out the opportunity to realize that God is everywhere all the time. Omnipresent, we call that. He is everywhere all the time. And you should have access when you're driving down the, down the road in the car. You should have access uh, up on the mountain, in your, in your church, in your closet, wherever it may be. Know that God is with you. Do not have any other gods. Do not make any idols, whatever form that may be. And third, third commandment is do not misuse God's name. Do not misuse God's name. This is one that perhaps uh, is often overlooked. It it's, doesn't sound as important. You know, what's, what's in a name, we might say. There's something very powerful in God's name. Now, I'm going to read to you a real brief story out of the book of Leviticus. And it may come across sounding rather harsh to our ears, but it's helped us understand the importance of keeping God's name holy. Leviticus chapter 24, uh, the setting is you have a young man who is, has a, a mother of belief and a father who, who does not believe, and he is in a situation where he's going to get in a fight and anger is going to rise up and listen to what happens. Chapter 24, verse 10. Now the son of an Israelite mother and an Egyptian father went out among the Israelites, and a fight broke out in the camp between him and an Israelite. The son of the Israelite woman blasphemed the name with a curse. So they brought him to Moses. His brother's name, his mother's name rather, was Shelomith, the daughter of Dibri, the Dan Danite. They put him in custody until the will of the Lord should be made clear to them. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take the blasphemer outside the camp. All who have heard him are to lay their hands on his head, and the entire assembly is to stone him. Say to the Israelites, if anyone curses his God, he will be held responsible. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be put to death. The entire assembly must stone him, whether an alien or native born. When he blasphemes the name, he must be put to death. Okay, this again sounds rather severe. But thanks be to God, we live in the day of grace. Are you glad for that? I'm glad I live in the day of grace. Thank you, Jesus. But don't allow the fact that we live in the day of grace for us to take for granted the fact that God still wants us to exalt His holy name. Do not misuse the name. Now, I want you to look at God's, one of God's first ways in which He expressed Himself by giving name to Moses. He said, I'm the father of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the intimate. But then he also said this word of sovereignty. Y-H-W-H, translated in English. This is the name he gave. This is the tetragrammation, is what they call it. Now, what do you need in words to be able to pronounce them? Vowels. Okay, A-E-I-O-U, sometimes Y. In this case, Y is not a vowel. Y-H-W-H. You cannot pronounce this word as originally given. So we have turned it into Yahweh, Jehovah. We take these words and we make it something we can pronounce. Originally, God gave this and you cannot pronounce it. Many modern Hebrew people and modern Christians, some will do this. Next one. What's missing there? Vow. Uh, I was proud of my youngest son. He yelled out O oh, earlier when I asked him. So way to go, he spell. But uh, we're missing O. Oh. You can't pronounce that. And so you'll see that in some modern Hebrew writing. They write it this way so you cannot pronounce it. Now perhaps that's overstating. Perhaps that we might say a little over the top. 
But notice the respect given there. When you cannot say the name of God, you can only write it, you are not going to misuse it. Do not misuse the name of God. It is something that where you will miss out on the fact that God is intimately involved in your life and wants you not only to be intimate with him and personal with him, but to respect him. Now, I may step on toes here a little bit, but let me give you an example how often this, this name is misused. Don't raise your hand, not asking for confession. If it sticks, you know, swallow it, but don't, don't raise your hand. Uh, if you're a texter and you've ever put the three letters OMG, you've taken the Lord's name and misused it. If you say those three words out loud when you're shocked about something, you've taken the Lord's name and misused it. God's name is to be revered. It is to be holy. It is to be set apart. I want to ask you some questions in regard to this. Four questions that ask you and ask me, am I misusing the God's, God's name? First of all, do I use God's name in a flippant manner? A flippant manner. I, I just kind of throw it out there whenever I feel like it, like a comma in a sentence. You, know, you, you hear this over and over again in many sentences when it has nothing to do with God. They're not even talking about God. They're just using his name. And perhaps you do this. You need to break that habit. Don't use God's name in a flippant manner. Second question, do I use God's name in a disrespectful manner? Do I use it in a disrespectful manner? Think about the person's, person closest to you. I don't mean geographically. I mean intimately. Uh, I hope that's your spouse. If you're married, that you're close to your spouse or close to your child, close to a really good friend. Would you go out and use their name in a disrespectful way? I hope not. I hope not. But sometimes we do this to God. We use his name disrespectfully. C, do I use God's name in a threatening manner? This is what we see in the fight in Leviticus. This is what we see sometimes when your anger wells up, that you'll say things, and sometimes God's name will be inserted in those. In those. Do not misuse the name of God. God, Jesus, whatever. Don't misuse names of God. D, do I use God's name in a superstitious manner? A superstitious manner. This was often used in Old Testament times for many deities. They felt like if they could just have the name, they own that God in essence. And this is why you have Jacob wrestling with God and wanting, before he let him go, he wanted his name. In other words, I want God's power in me if I can just claim his name. We can't put God in a box. We can't use God's name as some kind of superstition. It, it's not if we just say the right words in the right pattern that God's going to bless what we do. That's not how God works. God says, I want you to see what I'm doing and get on board with that. Not, I want to do what I'm doing, and then God, would you jump on board with me? We do not need to use his word, his name, rather, in a superstitious manner. We need not have any other gods before him or by him. We need not make any idols, and we need to make sure we do not misuse his name. Fourth commandment. Fourth commandment is keep the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath. Listen again from Deuteronomy chapter 5. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath. Observe the Sabbath. You see a lot of verses I left out in there. Most of us don't deal with donkeys and maidservants and manservants. Uh, but we do have those people in our lives that we need to allow to rest and we need to allow ourselves to rest. Some of us are guilty of resting and not letting other people rest. Some of us are guilty of having other people rest, and we ourselves do not rest. Again, go back to what I said earlier in this message, and that is you look upon our country, our nation, and the American dream is killing us. It's killing us, literally. Heart disease, fatigue, depression, sleeping pills, filling the cabinets. Why? Because people don't take a break. We are some of the most hardworking people in the world, but often we're spinning the wheels as we do so. That is why God says, I want you to take a break. I want you to go back to the curse. Genesis chapter 3. The sin has entered the world. God said to them, do not eat of this tree. Eve and Adam both eat of this tree. Eve's curse is pain and childbirth. What is Adam's curse? Not work. He was already working. He was already working. He was taking care of the soil and the ground. What happened, the curse was, this is now going to be tough. This is now going to be work, as we use the word, hard work. Somehow along the way, 
We chose the curse rather than the commandment. He said, I have given you a commandment. Take a break. Isn't that a great commandment? Imagine your boss coming up to you and say, I command you to take a break. I command you. Now, maybe if you don't want to pay you anymore, that's what it is. But it just out of sheer love, just comes up to you and says, go take a break. This is what God does. Tells you to take a break, to relax. What this was, and the original intention of the words, was to be a point of distinction between their culture and every other culture. To realize that God has things under control. They, they could even do it. God says, I'll provide this stuff called manna, which, by the way, means what is this? No, they didn't know what it was either. And literally, look it up. That's what the word means. What is this stuff? And, and he says, collect, the day before the Sabbath, collect two days' worth. Two days' worth. On the Sabbath, don't collect it. What do they do? They collect on the Sabbath, it rotted. Something in us, we don't want to slow down. We don't want to quit. We've made the choice to go back to the curse. Colossians chapter 2 is a chapter in the New Testament that explains to us why we do not need to celebrate Sabbath in a, in a very legalistic way. I understand that. We're not going to get hung up on, on which day to have it and how long it needs to be. But the point of the commandment is this. We need to be people that take a break. I want to tell you about a little fairy tale that's driven me nuts. Um, the little kid I didn't really understand. I got a little older. It really just started to bother me. It's three little pigs. Three little pigs. You see, I think it's wise that pig number three used bricks because big bad wolf was coming. I think it wasn't so wise that pig number one and pig number two were building with straw and sticks. But what was the point of that fairy tale? It was to teach kids from day one, work, 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 work. Now, it ends well. All three pigs are doing what? They're standing in the house, dan playing, dancing instruments. You know, I've seen the Disney version. What have you seen? You know, they're dancing around the, the dancing pigs. You ever get that one? It, it's fun, but I, here's what we do. We're the third pig that built the good house, and we may dance around a little bit, but we still got the masonry tools in our back pockets just in case we need to build another house right away. We don't slow down. We don't take a break. Shame on us. Shame on us. I want to ask you four questions. Again, this, I don't know which, which uh, commandment of the four is going to hit you more closely today. Perhaps this is the biggest for you. We seem to be workaholics around here. A ask, answer these questions. When did I last take a nap? I recommend after lunch today. I recommend it. I remember how sad we were when our three kids outgrew naps. Take them. When's the last time you took a nap? Second, do I, do I always volunteer for overtime? Volunteer for overtime is not a bad deal, but do you always do it? Are you first in line? Number three is going to tell you why you may do that. Do I have to work so much because I live above my means? Do I have to work so much that I live above my means? This is the American epidemic. For years we've been talking about the American dream. Years we're talking about compared with the Joneses, whatever you want to call it. It's lack of contentment. Lack of contentment. I've got to have the bigger house. I've got to have the better car. I've got to have the nicest clothes. I've got to have the latest and greatest of iPhones and everything else. And what do we do? We go in and say, I am going to have, if we're married, we're both going to work as long as we can so someday we can sit back and relax. And guess what? That day never comes. Because you bought so much stuff that it takes you forever to pay it off, and you never do. And you just keep work, 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 work. Now don't, I'm not asking everybody to go quit your jobs and be lazy. Hear me. But I'm asking you to slow down a little bit, not because I think you should, but because God commanded you that you do. Because what Sabbath does, above anything else, is it makes you stop and realize that you're not God. There's not one person in this room, including the one speaking, that is really that important. I could drop dead right here, please God no, but I could drop dead right here, and guess what? This church would go on. You could drop dead this week, and your business would still go on. We're not that important. Take a break. I want to add to your notes. I want to give you four R's that help summarize 
what we've talked about today. Write these four R's down. You don't have blanks, just make your own blanks. Write these four R's down. And, and these R's help us to understand how to love God, love the Lord our God. First of all is recognize, recognize that he is the one true God. Recognize, write the word recognize. Recognize. Second R I want you to write down is to rely on him. To rely on him. Recognize who he is. Rely upon him. Recognize, rely. Third R, revere his name. Don't use it anymore flippantly. Don't use it out of context. Use it only in a holy manner. Fourth thing, rest. Rest. Recognize, rely, revere, and rest. Four words that summarize what we talked about this morning. I believe that if we're going to get to next week, which is where we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, we need to start first and foremost with loving our God, which makes us healthier people. Jesus said, if you will come after me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. That's the verse we're talking about for the next three years. And we deny self by realizing God's God and we're not by all of these ways we've mentioned. You've had a great opportunity to hear from men and women uh, already throughout this year, uh, about a half a dozen so far, and to talk about how God's called them uh, to deny self, whether it be by taking care of elderly folks or committing to more time with Christ uh, or whether it be understanding that there's temptation in life and here's how I overcome that, whatever those ways may be. This morning we're going to hear a testimony of a teenager in our church. Sometimes deny self is something we seek and we ask God, how can I do this? Sometimes deny self is, in so many words, forced upon us. And uh, this is Katie's story. Katie Elliott, as a teenager in our church, uh, about a year and a half ago was diagnosed with cancer. She had knee pain. It turned out to be cancer. And she's had multiple surgeries. And I love her honesty in this and her faith in God. You see, that C word came into her life, cancer. And it's not that it's been easy, as she'll say, but it's how did she respond to that. She's denied self by keeping faith in God. Now, we had a little technical difficulties earlier. I um, hope this is in video and audio, but we'll make sure we do it our best. Um, but uh, this is done by Skype. She's in Seattle just after surgery, and so we had to do it by Skype. So it'll be a little scratchier in there, so pay attention, and hopefully you'll be able to read lips if the video uh, comes on as well. But listen to this teenager who's, as we would say, much older than her years in her maturity. Hi, I'm Katie, and I was diagnosed with cancer a year and a half ago, I think. Um, and I grew up being Christian. I went to church with my parents all the time, and I didn't really get it until I was older, but I accepted Jesus, I think, when I was 10. I went to church, I told everything, but I guess I just didn't understand exactly how much it could do for you until I was down here in Seattle. When I got diagnosed, it was really hard and I struggled with my faith for a while and not really questioned it, just struggled a lot. And then after a while, I realized it could really help knowing that God was there and had a plan and there was all the reason helped a lot to me for me to get through it and for me to not be really bitter and mad that I was down here. Um, it was hard not to be angry all the time, just because it sucks to be down here, but I figured out that if I prayed about it and just trusted that it would be okay and sort of found the good in stuff, then it was going to be fine and could be happy and didn't have to worry about it. So the best day was I had a friend in town, a really nice day outside, we were going to ride the ducks. We hung out for a while and climbed the stairs to go on the ducks. I fell and I hurt my knee and it ended up being a disaster and I needed more stitches and it's actually still another like extra scar there on my leg, but 
for some reason that was still fun and okay because I didn't realize how bad I messed it up until we were home that night and we were done. I got a whole day with my friend not thinking about anything, not caring about anything. I didn't have to worry about if I was sick or if I was going to like be okay. I didn't have to worry about my leg. It was all fine. I had a day not to think about anything and that was great even though I messed up my leg that day. I didn't know it and so it was fine. One of the hardest days I think was my family came to visit. I was really really sick. We weren't expecting me to be sick. I wasn't supposed to be sick. The chemo was supposed to have worn off. And so my dad and my stepmom and Taylor came down and we were supposed to go shopping and have fun and hang out. We got a really nice hotel and I couldn't get out of bed. <laughs> I was really sick and couldn't keep down any food or drink or anything I tried. And I ended up in the hospital for a week after that and the one day I remember as the worst was the day they came in we were sitting in the car and I was trying to not be sick um, and I ended up needing like a plastic bag in the back seat of the van and I just remember hating that day and how sick I was because I was supposed to be able to hang out with my sister without having issues like I did with my friend when she was here. And it was hard not to be really, really upset that day. I would say the thing in the last year and a half that I've learned the most about God is it, he can make really awesome things happen in a really, really crappy situation. Um, I've met some of the coolest people and had some of the coolest things happen to me because of this or in spite of this. And I think that's awesome. Like, it could have turned into just the worst thing ever. And it does suck, but some really cool things came out of it. And I just proved that, to me, it just proved that he's still there and he still cares even if stuff sucks right now. I can see him wanting me to do something that helps other people that have been what I've been through. Maybe not the exact same thing, but I don't think I could be an oncologist. So yeah, not the same thing, but I want to be an orthopedic surgeon. So helping kids or people with bone issues, whether it's a tumor like mine was or just a broken bone, I think he's made it so I have more empathy with whoever the patient would be, no matter what it is, really, just surgery in general. And I think it would be the best thing I could do with what I've been through. Um, bye, guys. I should be back on the night, and I can't wait to see you. Bye. Her honesty of saying it's not easy, realizing it could have been better, but God took that which is really bad and has made some great things happen because of it. Been a testimony to the youth and to the adults of this church. And continue to pray for her. As I said, she's still in Seattle, recovering from surgery. And you hear those final words that she said she wants to go help others with this. Uh, she wants to reach out and help others. I don't know what God's calling you to do and deny self and, and perhaps it's going to be forced upon you as like it has been with Katie or perhaps it's going to be a choice you make that says this year I'm going to make a different decision and maybe that starts by just saying hey God you're God and I'm not uh, perhaps you this morning say you know I don't really think I know God you can meet him and I want to talk to you about that uh, what, what it means to give your life to Christ let me know I want to have a conversation with you pray with you and uh, let you know what Sarah did this morning when she was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.